Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. And I, I apologize for being late. Something about passing an exam back and all the students came by this afternoon. So um, I, uh, Don is helping me with a PowerPoint. I thought I like to use a PowerPoint presentation for maps and for some names and for some photos. So I thought that would be helpful. And then I brought a couple props and some books to pass around as well. So we'll, we'll start with that for just a minute. This is one of my favorite objects that I brought back from China on a recent visit. And it is a map that'll show the topography of China. And I think it's very useful when we're talking about domestic issues. And I primarily focus on domestic politics in China. I like to pass this around to my students. Even though you can't read any of the Chinese probably, it gives you a really good sense of the varied landscape in the country. And when I talk about the diversity, Oftentimes you're going to see there can be cities that are within, they're within maybe five or ten miles of each other, but it's very difficult to travel between those two cities because of the topography. So I'm going to pass that around. And then uh, when I was looking through the chapter, and I thought this was a great chapter in your Great Decisions book. I hope that you all had a chance to look at it. Um, Mike Lampton, who actually he was at Ohio State shortly before I went there to earn my PhD. Uh, Mike Lampton does a great job, and he's one of the best commentators on domestic Chinese politics and on U.S.-China relations. In one of his books, one of his more recent books, The Three Faces of Chinese Power, fantastic book. Um, he, Lampton is so well connected within the Chinese elite and has a very broad perspective and a deep perspective of some of the trends taking place within the country and how that impacts relations between our two countries. So I thought I'd pass this around. And then uh, he mentions uh, Susan Shirk's book. Susan Shirk is at UC San Diego, and this is a fantastic book, China, a Fragile Superpower. It is out in paperback, uh, so it's a little bit easier to cart around. But one of the things I really like about this book, she takes, I would call, a very measured approach to China's reemergence and what that means for the rest of the world. And again, she is someone who's been a player with uh, US-China policy from, on both sides of the Pacific. She says when she presents this book to her Chinese friends, they say, fragile superpower? What do you mean superpower? And then when she presents it to her American friends, they say, fragile superpower? What do you mean fragile? And so I think that really points to much of what Lampton's theme was in this essay for today, about how China's looking at the world and the world is looking at China. And there's a lot of perception and quite a bit of misperception going on as well. So I think that's a very useful book for those purposes. Sorry, I'm giving you a lot of reading. <laughs> um, this one I wanted to recommend, if any of you are going on a short plane ride uh, where you might have a couple hours and you don't have a whole lot to do and you want to look through a book, James Fallows, Postcards from Tomorrow Square. Some of you may have read this. Many of you are probably familiar with his essays that appear in The Atlantic. This is just a fantastic book. And we were lucky last year to have Fallows come speak on our campus. Um, he is admittedly not a China expert. And I think precisely because of that, his insight on what's going on within the country is very illuminating. And this is a great book for pointing out the diversity of the experience within China. He talks about some of the economic issues. He talks about environmental issues. He interviews one of the billionaires in China. He talks about some of the science and technology issues as well. This is very, very readable. And it's written in a format so that if you can only read a chapter and then you are switching planes, you're not going to get lost. So this is just a really good combination, and this is my last book, I promise. Uh, this is called What Does China Think by Mark Leonard. I was at a conference this past weekend at Ohio State University, and uh, the chair of our panel, who I've been friends with for years, he's an international relations scholar, he said to me, he said, you know, all of you focus on China. He says, it seems like you missed some of the most important trends. He goes, what does it mean to be a liberal or a conservative within China? And I just looked at him and I said, that's a really good question. Uh, but this book would be one of the first ways that I would approach it because Mark Leonard, who's a journalist, tries to dissect, thank you, he tries to dissect uh, some of the intellectual and ideological trends taking place within China. And, you know, too often we look at China and we say, ah, oh, communist, you know, and all communists look at things the same way. And, I mean, I'm sure none of you view things that way, but it's very, very complicated within the CCP, within the Chinese Communist Party, all these debates about how are we going to remain relevant? 
I mean, you know, there's not a big collection right now of countries run by communist parties. And let's say that China doesn't really want to associate very closely with many of them that do. So this is a great book for that purpose. And uh, before I pass it around, there's a quote that he starts this book with. And I was going to use it to preface my comments this morning, or this afternoon. Busy day. Very few things that happen during my lifetime will be remembered after I am dead. Even 9-11 or the Iraq War, events which transfixed us, took innocent lives and decided elections, will gradually fade until they become mere footnotes in the history books. But China's rise is different. It is the big story of our age, and its after effects could echo down from generations to come. And we can debate if that's accurate or not, but I thought that was a very interesting way to start a book. So, thank you, Donna. Put that in the bucket. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And then clicker back here. Yes, it's just behind the people in the back. Teach you in grad school how to, how to attach a microphone. Okay, can you hear me with that now? And, and please just, just flag me down. And sometimes I talk very quickly, so please just, just let me know. I really want this. I prepared a couple of slides just to preface and give us all some common background, but one of the things that I love about Great Decisions Talks, and I've been doing these since I was a graduate school at Ohio State a graduate student at Ohio State, I really like the engagement and the questions that you have. So what I've prepared is just to set the stage, you know, however you would like to um, direct the conversation, please, I'm, I'm very open to that. But I always like to open up with a picture of a map as well, and I've got the topographic map going around. But uh, just, just a couple of things to point out, you know, obviously we're talking about the capital right up here in Beijing, and then this is a territory, Taiwan. Uh, one of the themes that, that I'm going to be talking about within Chinese domestic politics is that I think one of the biggest challenges that, take, that Beijing faces right now is that it's not quite as strong as it should be to try to enforce many of its mandates. And that might run counter to many of the images that, that some of you may have about China, where so many of us look at it as the world's largest communist party, the world's largest standing military, and you know, when Beijing says jump, one point you know, three billion people ask how high. And what we really see when we look beneath the surface, particularly for some of the vexing social problems that are taking place in the country, a big part of the dilemma is that the sky is high and the emperor is far away. That's an old imperial maxim that I would argue rings more true today than at any other time in history. And that again is why I think that topographic map is very interesting and useful. Because in, even if you just look, you know, we've been talking a lot about Xinjiang province, which is right up here in the uh, northwest, and then, of course, Tibet. What happens in Beijing oftentimes takes quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of time to whittle its way to, to each one of those regions. And so many of the directives in Beijing about limiting taxation collection, reigning in wayward officials, Enforcing central mandates, even as central as the one child per couple policy, those mandates oftentimes are ignored and distorted once they leave Beijing. So that's another image I like to use when we open up, the, uh, open up our discussion. Okay, I like to approach Chinese politics as a very complicated phenomenon. I actually, the subtitle for my class that writes Stain on Chinese Politics is a study in contradictions. And I tell students the very first day even within the course of the first half of a lecture, I may contradict myself, but it will probably be an accurate contradiction. Because so many times what we see with China is not an either or situation, but really much more so but and. Um, I'm working on a revision right now for a book on co the comparative politics of the third world with a colleague at Wright State. And China is included as one of those case studies. And every quarter, I know who my most perceptive students are when they challenge me on that the very first day. They don't know what I study as far as my independent research, and they'll raise their hand and say, this is crazy. Why do you include uh, the People's Republic of China as a member of the third world or as a developing country? Their economy is ruling the world right now. And I say, well, they do have a very strong economy, fastest growing economy, and many people are looking to China to, to, to help bring the world out of the global economic recession. Uh, but, in addition to that, you've got one of the largest gaps between the rich and the poor. And uh, as 
how Fallows talks about in that uh, Letters from Tomorrow Square book. There are regions that you can travel to in China where you feel like you're going back centuries. So you've got economic development and economic growth and fastest growing economy and rampant poverty, dire poverty. In some cases, poverty that's even worse than people experienced in the 1950s. So I think that there's just a lot of uh, com complexities that are involved. I really like to highlight the diversity that exists within China. And you know, it, it, it really became clear to me a couple years ago when I showed a film. Uh, it was a great film about uh, China's entry into the World Trade Organization and what that was going to mean both for China, and, but more importantly for the United States. And it showed many different slices of life throughout the country. Well, one of my graduate students, a very bright student who actually had lived his whole life in Europe, he came up to me afterwards and he said, Dr. Lerman, he goes, that was a great video. He says, I have to admit, I thought all Chinese looked alike until I saw this video. And, and the fact that Marcus admitted that to me, I thought that just meant the whole class probably had that perception as well. But you know, it was a little bit of a reminder to me of how simple it is for all of us to homogenize big groups of people that we don't know anything about, or even that we know quite a bit about, but we just think, ah, oh, you know, the Chinese. I mean, look at our own political discussion in this country. You know, we take, take it as a given that Democrats don't all agree with Democrats and Republicans, and we look at what's going on with, on our own political landscape. I would argue the same thing is happening within the Chinese political party right now. Factions are huge. And um, let me help pass that back. And, and a disagreement within a group of people that, on a simple view, we would say, ah, oh, you know, all the, all the communists agree on whether or not to devalue the, or revalue the UN or what direction we should take with North Korea or the United States. And these disagreements are huge. Now, as part of that diversity, of course, there's a lot of uh, ethnic and national diversity. 55 different ethnic groups within the country, and China has been, in recent years, really trying to highlight uh, much of the unique contributions of these ethnic groups. So I just included a picture. There's these wonderful parades that take place a couple times um, throughout the year where uh, everyone who is a member of these ethnic minorities is encouraged to, to dress up and to you know, to use their uh, native language, which is en encouraged in many of the regions, and highlight their unique contributions uh, to society. But nothing is typical, I would argue, in China. You, it's really tough for me when people ask me to convey a typical Chinese experience or a typical Chinese approach to something. And I usually turn that back around and say, you know, it's really tough for us to, to make such generalizations about many of our own cultures as well. Uh, the superlatives. I, I, I married a, a gentleman from up, upstate New York, and I used to tease him that there's something about upstate New York that speaks everything in superlatives. The biggest county fair, the largest river, and then when I kind of looked in the mirror, I, I do the same thing with China, and it's very easy to do. Um, <clears throat> there, China has the most female billionaires. I thought that was an interesting statistic I came across recently. There's 14 female billionaires in the world, six of whom are in China. China has the most cities with a population of more than a million. Okay, that's not too surprising because we know about the, the size of the, of the population. China has the most internet users. Okay, trying to get an accurate measure of the number of people who are using the internet in China is definitely shooting at a moving target. But this past July, the, we believe the number of internet users in China surpassed the entire population of the United States. So, and, and it's very interesting, and I'd like to talk a little bit uh, later on this afternoon about the, the multiple Im impacts the internet could have within China. By the way, you know the Nobel Peace Prize is gonna be announced Friday morning. Do you know that the internet was one of the nominees <laughs> for the Nobel Peace Prize? So, and I found that kind of interesting, but it does have the backing of Shireen Abadi from Iran, a formal Nobel uh, Prize re recipient herself. So, um, you know, I think that'd be very interesting. A number of Chinese human rights activists, we believe, have been nominated as well. But uh, many superlatives within China, and just a couple of those areas that, that I highlighted. Okay, I talked about the contradictions that China is really a, a but and society where you can have the fastest growing economy and the largest gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, China and Brazil actually hold, hold that, those distinctions of the two countries that have the greatest gap uh, between, between those two segments. And it's interesting to, to look at those two countries because, of course, we've got Brazil with a uh, struggling, but um, albeit a democracy, and then China. And, and both leaders in both countries are saying they want to make sure that they manage the wealth gap 
better than the other. It's kind of interesting to hear the Brazilians. Well, we don't want to have the Chinese problem. And then the Chinese say, well, we're doing everything we can to make sure we don't have the Brazilian problem. So, you know, contradictions in, in uh, many different ways. Uh, for those of you who read the Washington Post, John Pomfret, fantastic journalist. He's been covering China for, for, for decades now. Um, he was recently uh, talking. He said, when we approach, when Westerners approach China, there tends to be one of two different approaches. Either you know, China is all good or China is all bad. Okay, so that sort of simplistic approach, putting China in one box or the other. And then those who revel in what he calls the mind-boggling complexity of the place. And I will, in full disclosure, tell you I'm definitely of that latter camp. And um, he was actually talking about Fallow's book when, when he, he made that statement. Uh, and then in that bit about contradiction, you know, ever since I was in graduate school in the early 1990s, people have been predicting the inevitable democratization of the People's Republic of China. I remember when I was in grad school, you know, shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, struggles for transition to democracy throughout that region, and there was this group of us, I guess I need to stay away from you. There was this group of us who were all focusing on China, and we kept saying, we're not sure that those changes are necessarily going to bleed, spill over into the PRC. And, and I would argue that's one of the more interesting developments that we see right now. Why hasn't China made this transition to democracy? How do they continue to buck this trend? And perhaps, more importantly, for those of you who, who want to pay attention to more than just China in the world, how are other countries looking to China as a possible model? And we see many African states right now talking with Chinese leaders and saying, hmm, how are you doing this? How are you getting this tremendous rate of economic growth, you know, highest rates that we've seen in uh, double digit now for 15, almost 20 years, but you're maintaining this authoritarian hold on power. And to the extent that China is being viewed as a model for other countries to emulate uh, is, is posing quite a few contradictions as well. And that leads me to this last point that I have up on the screen. Increasingly, I'm viewing the many, many changes that are taking place in China in this image of layered transitions, where you've got so much of this happening, not independent, so you don't just have political changes taking place, and then you've got economic changes which are pushing back on the political changes. And then look at what's going on in Chinese society. You know, increasingly well-educated, increasingly well-traveled, the development of a middle class, the development of a, a very small, but albeit a billionaire, uh, segment of the population. And you know, all of this is impacting each other, and it's just happening on top of each other. And I think it makes it very difficult to try to pin down exactly what is happening. Um, James Fallows, that book that I'm passing around, the, the Letters from Tomorrow Square, he argues that the most important aspect of China is not its size, is not its economic growth, but its speed. He says things in China happen fast, and they happen quickly. And if you want to understand what's going on, or you want to participate in it, you have to try to keep up with the speed with which that change is taking place. So those are just a couple of opening images that I would like to present. By the way, the, the photo down there at the bottom, I, I hope over here that you can each see it, uh, it's a picture of some of the village committee elections. When I was talking about the non evitability of, uh, of democratic elections or democratic change in China, it is important to note that there are some democratic procedures and even some democratic competition taking place at the most local levels of Chinese society, where you've got elections to what are called the villagers' committees, and you also have uh, limited elections for the local people's congresses, which are the most local level legislatures in China. And we could certainly talk about this in our discussion time, but just to tell you what the rationale is behind opening those election processes up, it really is to serve as a safety valve to help divert some of the dissension and some of the concerns that people have about politics to try to divert that from Beijing and say, well, you, you, elected, you elected your local leaders and uh, maybe you need to, to focus your energies on that. But, but those are some very important changes that have been taking place. I think I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't talk briefly, at least briefly, about some of the leadership changes that have been taking place and are getting ready to take place in China in the next couple of years. Because I think, you know, as Americans who are looking to this country and trying to figure out what direction is it, is it going to take, some attention to the elite politics of the country are very important. 
And the way that Chinese look at their leaders and their leadership is very different than anything we are used to in uh, democratic Western countries. And uh, the Chinese leaders really need to be viewed in terms of the generations in which they are placed. So I thought this was just a great poster that showed you, you know, each generation of leadership. And you know, even if we just look at the first two leaders there, the differences between Mao Zedong, okay, ideologue, revolutionary, clearly um, in contradiction to anything with the West. You know, it was Mao who believed that China didn't need any other country and could try to be completely solo in its own development. Of course, that didn't work out very well. We had a famine of 30 million people. Sometimes people say 50 to 75 million people died. But we had Mao Zedong, who died in 1976. Then followed by the pragmatic leader, who they gave a good six inches to in that picture, because he was quite a bit shorter than uh, Mao Zedong. You know, Deng Xiaoping had the complete opposite approach to the rest of the world and even to how politics should take place in China. Um, and many of you probably remember you know, some of the era of his leadership. Um, you know, one of the things that makes studying Chinese politics very fun is that there's a lot of catchphrases that we use to characterize what's taking place. And uh, Deng Xiaoping, you know, he was the leader who said it's all right for some people to get rich first. And to get rich is glorious. Maybe, maybe you've heard that one before. And people took him up on his word. And you know, we've got some of those billionaires to show for it. Well, one of his other statements that was extremely important, he said, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches the mouse. And when I toss that out to my students, that's when they all think I've completely you know, lost it and forgotten which class I'm teaching. They're like, why is she talking about cats and mice? It's a perfect statement in saying how he said, let's just get things done. You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, he was really challenging the importance of ideology within the country. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what the strain or the, the school of thought is. Let's, let's catch the mice. Let's engage in the world economy. Let's develop um, and let's become a more comfortable society. Now, the exercise that I do in my class to see if students understand the difference between Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, I say, how would Mao Zedong have switched that saying. Okay, if Deng Xiaoping said, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches the mouse. Mao Zedong's version, it doesn't matter if the cat catches the mouse as long as it's red. And, and I raise that because it shows you the fundamental difference between these two leaders. Okay, and Mao, Mao Zedong made Chinese people proud to be Chinese again. And I always challenge my students, See, so growing up in the United States, I don't think any of you have ever struggled with your pride about being America, you know, because all of our students have grown up in the age where America has been strong and powerful and the, the beacon of freedom and democracy around the world. The Chinese, of course, didn't have that. During Mao Zedong's entire lifetime, China was at war, either with itself or with neighbors. Uh, China was really at its bottom. And you know, Mao was able to give people a sense of hope and a sense of pride of being Chinese again. And you know, that he used quite extreme measures to do that. But that was sort of his contribution to, to some ill effects uh, as leader. Deng Xiaoping then followed, and he had personally suffered at the hands of Mao Zedong, okay, where you know, he had been condemned during the Cultural Revolution. His son today is paralyzed because of some activities during the Cultural Revolution. And you know, it's not then surprising to see this sort of pragmatic reaction to that. And we see that, you know, for our purposes today, it was Deng Xiaoping who reached out to engage China with the rest of the world. And for all that we are talking about today, and, and the quote that I used from that one book about China's reemergence being the single most important event of our lifetime, that quite simply would not have been possible if you didn't have the pragmatic leadership of Deng Xiaoping. So then, that was the first generation and the second generation, really mirror images of each other. Then you had Jiang Zemin come to the fore. And he had an impossible task in many ways as far as trying to imprint his own unique legacy of leadership. He wasn't part of the revolution. He didn't have the strong connection to the foundation of the country. He also didn't have the personality that either one of these men had, probably to the betterment of Chinese society maybe, but you know, he didn't have that charismatic leadership. Yes? Could you say his name again? Absolutely. Jiang Zemin. And it's J-I-A-N-G. Uh, Chinese surnames are placed first, so it's Mr. Jiang. And, and Zemin is his given name, Z-E-M-I-N. And let me just tell you a little bit about how he came to, to power. 
because he was a party leader in Shanghai, China's largest city, in Tian during Tiananmen Square in 1989. You know, I meant to ask at the beginning, how many of you have spent even a brief amount of time in China at some point? Oh, wow, fantastic, okay. Uh, have any of you been to Shanghai? This is Shanghai amazing. In, in Shanghai was the first city that I uh, studied in, in China in uh, 1991, shortly after Tiananmen Square. And I think you know, being there and seeing what a centerpiece of Chinese economy Shanghai is helps me understand the task that this gentleman faced as a party leader in Shanghai during the student demonstrations of that spring and summer. Okay, now, of course, all of you remember watching that very clearly. Boy, was this ever an awareness that I was uh, starting to become older than our students. I said something about 1989, and I usually say, so, about where were you? And then finally, <laughs> one of the students pulled me aside and says, Dr. Lerman, we weren't born yet. <laughs> so that's when I immediately realized I was no longer of the, of the same generation. So you know, Tiananmen Square was such a formative period, especially for US relations with China. We, we had uh, Min Xin Pei, a China scholar from Claremont McKenna College at Wright State last year. And, and he gave, I think, one of the best descriptions for why Tiananmen Square was a turning point for US-China relations. He said, prior to 1989, most Americans, they remembered the ping pong diplomacy and um, you know, the secret trips to China, which is just a fascinating diplomatic story. When it, with that in mind and with the opening of that relationship, many Americans, even if they didn't articulate it, thought that eventually, as we worked cl more closely with China, China was going to look more like us. They, might, they may not be a democracy, but they were going to have more freedoms and the comfortable. They were going to try to look a little bit more like the West and like the United States. Pei argued that after June 4th, 1989, Americans realized that that simply was not going to happen and that China was going down such a different path. Um, and, and really, that has borne out that that, that, that uh, different path has followed. Now, I have to tell you, my Chinese friends, they can't stand it when I make that sort of argument. And they will consistently argue with me and say, why are Americans fixated? And that's often the word they use. Why are so many Americans fixated on Tiananmen Square in June 4th? Why is that so important? And then, when my friend knew I was from Ohio, he says, you know, we moved on from Kent State. I'm not constantly throwing Kent State in your face. And, and I'm not sure that that's the best comparison, but I think it, it poses an interesting question. You know, if that continues to be the lens, and I think probably for most of us in this room, that's probably one of the most important lenses by which Americans view China. Uh, Chinese say, you know, that's, that's history and we need to move on. Well, clearly their own political system hasn't moved on yet. But it was the third leader here with the third generation, again, uh, Jiang, who rose to power and went to Beijing because of Tiananmen Square. He was the party secretary in Shanghai in 1989, and he was able to hold a pretty clear uh, closed lid on the protests and the demonstrations. We have not heard about widespread bloodshed or uh, loss of life in Shanghai. He was able to mediate that quite a bit, and he was promoted to a position of power because of that. And I share that with you because when we understand how someone comes to power, it helps us understand how they're going to govern. And that was really his priority, you know, maintaining stability, keeping the lid on dissent. And when I meet with my friends at the Air Force Base who follow uh, Chinese security policy, and I, I talk about each leader's legacy, the legacy for the third gentleman here is that he survived. Uh, that China remained intact, Taiwan did not break away, there were no significant demonstrations. A relatively bland legacy when you compare him to the prior two leaders, who were both revolutionary leaders. Then when we get to the fourth generation, this is the generation that we're currently dealing with right now. Uh, this is President Hu, right here, H-U. Uh, Donna, you probably remember this. The, week, the, the weeks around his uh, inauguration into power, there were all kinds of jokes around the internet. And this was, of course, during the uh, Bush presidency when Condoleezza Rice was Secretary of State. So President Bush called Condi into the office and said, Condi, who was the president of China? <laughs> okay. Yeah, and see, again, this is why I love meeting with groups like this, because my students are like, yeah, well, why is that funny? And I, I keep following it through. Well, the funnier thing, if you happen to be a little bit of a nerd about this stuff like I am, is shortly thereafter when the prime minister was named, do, do any of you know the name of the Prime Minister of China, the surname? Wen. <laughs> W-E-N. 
So see, these are the things that hum keep, you know, Chinese politics humor, humorous for, for those of us. But there's a, president, there's a picture right there of President Hu Jintao with a Gulf, uh, represented from the Gulf Cooperation Council. And then um, and put two pictures of the Prime Minister. Here's Prime Minister Wen right here. And something that I like about both of these pictures is it conveys an aspect of their leadership style. Okay, you know, obviously very Western. It's under this fourth generation that we see increased engagement, not only with the Western world, but with the global world, okay, especially with the Middle East and Africa, which I'd like to discuss. But then look at this picture. This is a really warm picture. This isn't a propaganda poster like we had during the uh, Maoist years where everybody's just you know, bubbling over with love for the chairman. But Wen Jiabao, the current prime minister, has been affectionately referred to as Grandpa Wen. Now here that might be an insult, but in Chinese culture, uh, that is a huge compliment of, and conveying some warmth. And this was a picture taken shortly after the devastating earthquake that took place in Sichuan province, if you remember that, in 2008, months before the Olympic Games took place. And Wen Jiabao boarded a plane shortly after news of the earthquake hit, got off the plane and very ceremoniously, you know, started directing forces here and there, but also meeting with the citizens and trying to convey a sense of empathy with the population that most people in China had not yet experienced. And uh, there's a very different feeling within the Chinese population toward their leadership today than we've seen in any of these other generations. I actually would argue each generation had a very different approach to their leadership. But, um, you know, one thing I didn't add about Mao Zedong, and those of you who have been to China, you probably saw the mausoleum. That is a tremendous experience. Those of you, anybody been to Beijing and walked through the mausoleum? You know, every time that I stand in that huge line and, and make that tour, it makes me reflect on the fact that we don't do that in democratic countries. You know, we don't hold our leaders in that sense of, I don't know if reverence is the right word, I'm not sure what is the right word, that we're going to embalm them, supposedly, and then display their body for all to see. Of course, when a president passes away, the body lays in state or significant leader, but, you know, to, to have that. And I think that ritual that uh, China and a handful of other countries have engaged in to preserve the bodies of their leaders so that everyone can walk by shows a different relationship, shows a different sense of leadership in these cultures as well. Now, it's important to point out with these four men, the only person who lies in state, of course, is Mao Zedong. And I'm not sure how much longer he's going to be in state like that, uh, which is something perhaps we can talk about. One last point that I'd like to raise about the current prime minister. You see this picture right here? This is from Tiananmen Square. Height of the demonstrations, okay, when the general secretary made his last public appearance. He you know, went to the students and with his megaphone, very high tech at that point, with his megaphone approached the students and said, please stand down. We as your leaders are divided and there's going to be bloodshed. Okay, well that was the last time that he was seen in public because of his public acknowledgement that the leadership was divided. That's a huge no-no, okay, in, in any authoritarian system, but especially any system that is being challenged. Right here, this is Wen Jiabao, standing right over his shoulder. And he was a secretary, and a secretary in a very rich bureaucratic sense. Uh, he was a secretary to the uh, former prime minister, and he survived. And I think that shows us something that's very different in Chinese politics today. Because in prior generations, being so closely associated with someone who was condemned meant your political career was over. So he's been someone who's been known to uh, be able to maintain these relationships, maintain these connections, even when they've been politically very, very sensitive, because so much of the unrest was put on, on his shoulders. So I wanted to highlight that. So if this is the current four generations. I wanted to make sure that you're aware of the fact that we, China is already experiencing a leadership change. And Donna, everything happens in 2012. <laughs> At, at Wright State, as in other state universities, we're moving to, se to semester. So very dramatic calendar transition. And China's also undergoing transition that year. So the current president is set for retirement in 2012. And you know, the fact that I can even stand up here before you and tell you that there's going to be a leadership change and this leader will step down after 2012 and convey that with some confidence is a huge change. You know, one of the first times I met with a great decisions group as a graduate student, first question that came from the audience was, well, you know, who are going to be, who are the next leaders going to be, and how's this going to play out? 
I couldn't confidently answer. I remember a couple of people mumbling in the back, like, well, isn't she studying Chinese politics? Well, things are very, you know, at that point, very much in flux because one thing I didn't tell you about man number three uh, who rose after Tiananmen Square, he was not choice number one. He wasn't even choice number two. He was the third hand-picked successor. He was the one who survived. Um, so, you know, things were very much in flux until very recently. Uh, but we have had already one group that you know, stepped down in 2002, and now Hu Jintao, the current president, and his prime minister are set for retirement in 2012. And the group to follow them, who are essentially right now mostly provincial leaders throughout the country, uh, who have been you know, earning their party credentials through some of the more local offices, very similar to a path of power that we see here in the United States through governors and senator positions, they're qualitatively different than any of the other leadership generations that we've seen before. And as someone who focuses on Chinese domestic politics, this is really important to pay attention to because I think the entire educational background and life experience of this group is going to be very different. So you see here, this is a group that studied law. Of course, law as a discipline didn't exist in China or was wiped out throughout the Cultural Revolution. And really, it was the 1990s when it was operating again as a field. I mean, I have friends who were judges who studied law years after they were a judge, so because those were political appointments. Business experience, you know, when we talk about the role of the Chinese economy and the dramatic changes, you know, these are people who are very comfortable with that and very connected even to many multinational corporations and relations. Social studies, philosophy, just as the fields of study for this generation. But perhaps most importantly, especially for trying to figure out you know, can China put some of its past behind it? This group is wholly untainted by Tiananmen Square. They weren't in any position of power during Tiananmen Square in 1989. And I don't want to be deterministic and say that means that this group can, you know, render a different verdict on the student protesters. But they might be more comfortable entertaining some level of discussion about Tiananmen Square which the other people, especially Jiang Zemin, you know, have not been comfortable doing. And there is constant pressure from groups within and outside of China to reevaluate and to say, can we have an objective discussion about these issues? And the day that China can wholesale begin that discussion, we're going to see a dramatic shift in you know, that relationship between leaders and between citizens. Um, you know, the question that this generation, the most significant question this generation is going to face, how does the CCP remain relevant? You know, I, I had this great political cartoon, and it says, you know, the Collected Association of Communist Party Leadership. Great big boardroom, large board table. Then you've got your Chinese representative, you've got your Vietnamese representative, and your Cuban rep representative. And it says, I move to dispense at the calling of the roll. Yeah, because there's only three of them. And, and look, and I remember the first time I went to China was 1991. I came back shortly before all of the events that took place in the Soviet Union. I remember so clearly sitting in my parents' family room in Cincinnati watching that news and being very concerned for what that meant for, for China because I knew what was going to happen. The Chinese leaders were watching the collapse of control, the dissolution of the Soviet Union saying, not here. We're going to make sure that that contagion, which is the way they refer to it, doesn't, doesn't spread. And um, you know, whether or not now we're at a stage where this discussion and uh, the meaningfulness, what does it mean to be a communist party when you've got the fastest growing capitalist economy in the world? You know, I, I think I confuse my students sometimes when I say China is communist in the name of its political party because I teach political ideology as well. And when you teach the theories of communism, and then when you look at the reality on the ground of China, I mean, those of you, especially those of you who have been there or who are working uh, in business relations with Chinese companies, what's communist about it? Uh, so trying to make sure that the CCP can remain relevant. I will tell you one little ditty that a friend shared with me. CCP, Chinese Communist Party. As the Chinese Communist Party becomes less and less communist, it needs to become more and more Chinese. What is going to be its rallying cry? Nationalism has become a big part of it, and especially, you know, many of you probably follow the debates within Taiwan uh, and, and other issues. I mean, Olympic Games are going to bring out nationalism. Uh, many of the appeals that we've seen and the mobilization within the country 
around this nationalist um, appeal has really been to try to maintain the meaningfulness and the need for the Chinese Communist Party. So I think that's going to be just a handful of the questions that the fifth generation is going to be struggling with. Just want to briefly introduce you to the likely members of the next generation of leaders. I say this with about maybe 60% confidence, just because we still have quite a bit of time, but each has been promoted to significant positions. The current vice president there, uh, his name is pronounced Xi. An X in Pinyin is pronounced like an SH. So Xi Jinping, uh, you see there, by Chinese standards especially, he's a youngin. Um, one time, one of the most significant mass associations within China is the All China Communist Youth League. And they came to visit Ohio State when I was a grad student. And I was invited to go meet with them. I thought, oh, this is great. I was in my young 20s. But I'm going to meet a bunch of 20-year-olds in China, maybe some teenagers. I lowered the age by about 40. Because youth in China is about where I am right now. I mean, it's like 40s and 50s and early 60s. And uh, in fact, they were amazed. I was in China during the uh, re-election of Bill Clinton. And everybody kept pulling me aside saying, Really? Such a young boy for president? Um, so, you know, age conveys a very, very different, different sense. Okay, so Xi Jinping, uh, some of his uh, legacy, he has some connection to the revolution. His father was a so-called long marcher. Okay, if any of you have studied some, some Chinese history before, you know, this was a tremendously disastrous escape that the communists tried to... Um, essentially retreat from the oncoming nationalist army during the Civil War. I always use this as an example of the success of propaganda because only the Chinese Communist Party could make the loss of 97% of its participants into a victory. And I've, been, I've attended some long march galas and celebrations in China. Anyone who survived the long march was seen to be an immortal in, China's, in Chinese uh, recent history. So he has some connection as a princeling to his father being a part of the revolution. Uh, his background is in science. He studied chemical engineering as an undergrad. Uh, he studied Marxist theory for his doctorate. And uh, he studied at Tsinghua University. Uh, those of you who have been in Beijing, the two major universities are Tsinghua, which is a science and technological university, and Beida, uh, Peking University, Beijing University, which is more of your liberal arts uh, university. The, the running joke in China between those two schools is that the Tsinghua grads, the scientists and the engineers, they're running the country, and the Beida grads, your liberal arts types, they're in jail uh, for <laughs> protesting what's going on in the country. And they say that Peking students will protest everything from the rice being too watery within the cafeteria to you know, appeals for democracy and human rights. Almost all of the major demonstrations for human rights and democracy in China have started at uh, Beida, at Beijing University, okay, which, which he did not graduate from. Then uh, the, oh, he is being billed as the leader of the Shanghai clique. As I hinted to earlier when I was saying a communist is not a communist is not a communist, Chinese politics are very factionalized. Okay, there's significant factions or cliques within the uh, political system. And he is seen as the leader of the cosmopolitan, um, financially and economically connected Shanghai clique. And many people in the West view him as a fantastic candidate for leadership because of many of those connections that he has fostered. And that he would be a really uh, very rational and reasoned, experienced person to try to lead some of the very difficult financial and economic negotiations that are likely to come. Uh, let's see, he was named, yeah, he made Time's list of top 100 people. Uh, he was uh, number 17 in 2009. So he's got quite a bit of awareness and name recognition uh, outside, of, uh, outside of mainland China. Now, his number two in command, if you will, the current vice premier and the individual who is tapped as the most likely pri next prime minister or premier of the People's Republic of China. Again, his surname is listed first, so it's Mr. Li. And he is a Beida grad. He is from that university where most of the people end up um, challenging things. He has studied law as his undergrad and economics for his uh, master's degree. And he is being billed as the person who will speak out for the China that's left behind. 
And I think that's really important to keep in mind. Because remember my theory about contradictions and saying China's fastest growing but also biggest gap? That is going to be, if you are a leader of an authoritarian country trying to keep a lid on politics, this gap between the rich and the poor and the potential for demonstrations and protests is going to be what keeps you up at night. And in fact, every year, China sets a new record for the number of officially recognized protests and demonstrations against uh, communist leaders and communist leadership. Well, he is seen to be the compassionate face of that side of China uh, and will be the person who will speak out for developing the West uh, because the West is the part of China that is most disconnected from any of the fruits of the current economic reforms and economic policies. The clique that he is seen to be the leader of is that mass organization I highlighted earlier, the Youth League. And if you, if you have some time to investigate some of the groups and organizations within China, I would suggest you start with this group because it's very interesting. It's progressive in a Chinese sense where it's challenging much of the status quo of the current leadership. And also, uh, I did a study on Chinese newspapers a couple years ago. The newspaper that's published by the Communist Youth League, which is called Youth Daily, uh, the Youth Daily is the single most important paper within the People's Republic of China. Everybody thinks it's Xinhua, because that's the, the news agency or People's Daily, the paper that is uh, quoted most in our Western sources. People's Daily is direct from the Central Committee of the Beijing Chinese Communist Party. It's the official word. If you want to look for the location within the media of some discussion and dissent and debate, you're going to find it within the Youth League paper and the Youth League uh, membership. Very interesting organization. Now, um, i got to say, he also has a reputation of a person almost like Pigpen, where a cloud kind of follows him. Anything that he touches uh, has become problematic. A disaster seems to follow it, was how one article put it. Uh, when he was Communist Party Secretary of Hunan Province, fires broke out across the region. Um, then there was an AIDS outbreak in that same province and a couple of mine disasters. Okay, we, I think, are so much more aware in our world today of how dangerous mining is, but China's had a terrible safety record with their mines. Then when uh, the current president transferred him to a different province, to Liaoning province, uh, the bird flu broke out shortly thereafter. Uh, he's just someone who's kind of got the opposite of the golden touch. So we'll see if he's able to convey a sense of warmth like his predecessor is, if he indeed becomes the prime minister in 2012. So these are some faces that you're going to be seeing a little bit more of in the future. Now what I'd like to highlight in our discussion is some of the significant changes in relationships between the leadership and between the citizens in China. Uh, we don't take, do we take a break at all? Or? Uh, would this be a good time for a break? Uh, okay, okay. Let's, let's just take a, a short break, probably bathrooms down the hallway, a five